I don't know if you know that song. It, it goes on for several yeah. more verses, as Bob Dylan likes to do with his songs quite often. Everybody doing okay this morning? Yeah. It's, it's good to be here. And, and uh, last week, Danelle spoke. <laughs> well, it looks like I've got a partner today. So, uh, well, that was Bob Dylan's song, Serve Somebody. Gotta Serve Somebody. And it's funny that the gotta serve somebody is doesn't appear in the song. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's, anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. But it was the first track in the single from his album, Slow Train Coming. Maybe some of you might remember that. That was way back in 1979. Wow. But, you know, uh, some of us remember it, some of us don't. Those of, the, <laughs> those of you who are music enthusiasts, you might avail yourself and go back and listen to some some uh, classic rock. There's some good stuff back there. Anyway, um, but uh, Slow Train Coming was the first album of what was known as, as Dylan's gospel years. Yeah. And it was met with divisive reviews. Rolling Stone called it Dylan's best since Highway 61 Revisited, which was re released in 1965. John Lennon, however, who was a friend of, of, of Bob Dylan's, he criticized Dylan, both as a Christian and a musical artist during this period, and really was critical of his music. In fact, Lennon famously wrote a, a parody of the song called Serve Yourself. <laughs> And I, I wouldn't recommend that one because there's there's a little profanity that's laced throughout, just to kind of make his point. Nevertheless, the single won a Grammy for the best rock vocal performance by a male in 1979, and it is still Dylan's latest top 40 hit in the Hot 100, which peaked at number 24 and remained on the chart for 12 weeks. In 2016, Rolling Stone magazine listed the song as number 43 on its list of 100 greatest Bob Dylan songs. And it's been covered many times by many artists across musical genres throughout the spectrum over the past 40 years. So that's my musical trivia for the morning. So... Uh, well, I'm continuing our series, Practicing Spiritual Formation, and like I always like to do, I just want to hear from those of you in, in our congregation. How's it going? Have you been practicing, first of all? You've been practicing. How is the practice going? Would anyone like to share some of your experience? Well, last week, Danelle spoke about submission. If you were here, or maybe if you saw the, the sermon online, um, how did you like hearing from Danelle last week? <laughs> Very good. Well, it, it's interesting, like, um, she alluded to the fact that, you know, we've been talking about this stuff, and it seems like we're preaching to ourselves in the course of the week. And it seems like the stuff that we talk about ends up coming into application in the course of the week. Um, I, I think you all know that I, I've, I've started a new job, and, and, and so I'm, I'm in a, a situation where I'm having to submit myself, and I'm doing things sometimes that I don't really like to do. I haven't really been trained to do. And yesterday, we, I, I was, it, you know, it's a Saturday, you know? you know. Of course, we, we support EMS and we support the Sheriff's Department. So I knew going in that there was gonna be some on-call stuff. Well, yesterday I was going to take care of some business and I'm riding along and my boss calls. Hey, there's, there's an issue over at EMS2 that's, that's out on, on 290. 
you know, so I, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go do it. Give me 10 minutes and I'll, I'll, I'll head that way. Well, he calls back in about 10 minutes and it's like, hey, don't worry about it. They, they figured it out. And uh, okay, that's fine. So it just kind of went on about my day. And then he calls me again about, I don't know, it was about two, three o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, I just wanted to tell you, I really appreciate the fact, first of all, whenever I got hired, I was the only one who lived in Brenna. One of my coworkers lives in Cat Spring and, and my boss lives in Trinity. And it, it's, it's crazy. And, and he need, he's, might be watching this, so I won't, I won't say anything about him, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he, he, he'll drive in on Mondays and he stays at an RV park out on 290 during the week and then drives home for the weekend. So I'm the only person in town. And so we've had a few things happen and, you know, so I respond and, and well, he called me yesterday and he said, you know, I, I just wanted to tell you that I really appreciate the fact that you live in Brenham and that you're you're available whenever something goes on. And I'm like, well, well wasn't that what I was supposed to do? <laughs> he said, yeah, but I, you know, I just, I just really want you to know that I appreciate it. So, uh, so anyway, I, I, I just thought that was neat. And it kind of played in to what I'm going to be talking about today, which is service. Now, before I get started, I want to make sure, and this is, this is something that, that we try to do each week, it's kind of a disclaimer, that just because you do these things that we've been talking about, we've been talking about spiritual formation, just because, oh, are you ready? Oh, okay. We'll come back anytime you're ready. Just because you do these things, just because you practice submission, just because you practice prayer or fasting or any of the, these practices that we've talked about over the past, I don't know, what, uh, five, uh, six five, six weeks, that doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. These things don't make you a Christian. These are things that, that once you made the decision to follow Jesus, that when you do them, they enhance your relationship with him. Does that make sense? And so so what we're, we're talking about in, in terms of spiritual formation these are the things that help us live like Jesus lived. Mm -hmm. Things are divine. Right. So that's what this is about. This was, this was kind of the, the trajectory that I, I, I was on a, a few months ago whenever, whenever we, we decided, Let, let's just do this. Let's just go through and let's talk about these practices and then encourage each other to do these things. Because as we do these things, this is part of discipleship. We, we, we imitate Jesus. And because we're imitating him, we become more like him. You know, the, we, we become like the things that we, that we admire, that we, that we look up to. And so, so we, as we do this, as we're looking at what Jesus did, then we become more like him. So, so with that, I want to talk to you a little bit about service. The Apostle James wrote a letter that went to the first century church, and he said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's a reference to Proverbs 3.34. Oh, what? Say again? Gives grace to who? It was addressed to the first century church. Gives grace to who? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, stuff. sorry. I... My hearing is atrocious. I, I just want to tell you that. And, and uh, so she was, sorry, yeah, that is embarrassing, but it, it's true. I, I, too many years of playing drums and, and uh, loud amps and everything else. God gives grace to the humble. <laughs> I pronounce it humble and it's, it, it's not right. So uh, at least it, according <laughs> to these folks. But uh, anyway, uh, so let me start again. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Get away. Oh, <laughs> Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and God. 
in the world. Let there be tears for what you have done, and let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. If there's anything that our human nature doesn't like, it's to humble ourselves. Yeah. We don't like to be humbled. We want to look good. And when we, we humble ourselves, it makes us feel vulnerable. Yeah. For many, vulnerability equals weakness. And people fear being exploited. But humility is what makes submission possible. And if we won't humble ourselves, we can't submit to anyone else without it. And that was the point of what Bob Dylan was saying. We have to serve somebody. We have to submit ourselves. The definition of service is the action of helping or doing work for somebody else. It's about meeting the needs of others. Consequently, submission is what makes it possible to put the needs of others before our own. So we can begin to seek to meet the others, the needs of others, in service. But there's a crazy thing that happens whenever we decide that we want to serve others. This crazy thing happens. We find ourselves wanting recognition yeah. for what we did. Did you see what I did? You know, I held that door open for somebody. Did you see that? Did you see? I was nice today. <laughs> did you see that? Did you see what I did? That, that's our human nature at work. Yeah. And Jesus addressed that very attitude when he was saying, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues, in the streets, to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward that they'll ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private. And your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Now, can you imagine if in, in this day where, where the religious leaders were calling attention to every little thing that they did to demonstrate how holy they were? Did you see what I did? Did you see how much I put in the offering? Did you see that I helped this person? That's what a holy person does. They help people. They were wanting to be recognized for their acts of service. And they lost their way. But are we any different? I mean, do we look for recognition whenever... We do something. You know, I'm trying to be a nicer person. Did you, did you just see what I did? We're no different. The late president, Ronald Reagan, he was one of the first ones I think I ever paid attention to. He said, there is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. Isn't that amazing just how people want to make sure they get credit for, for something that they did, you know? 
Don't leave me out. I'll, I'll get offended. I mean, I'm important enough to be acknowledged for what I did. In celebration of discipline, Richard Foster said, nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service. And nothing transforms the desires of the flesh like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whines against service, but screams against hidden service. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition. It will devise subtle religiously acceptable means to call attention to the service rendered. Virtue signaling these days. Yes. If we stoutly refuse to give in to this lust of the flesh, we crucify it. Now, every month when we do communion, there's a passage that I that I I pretty much learned by memory, and I share that each and every time. It, it's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians to describe the communion, what Jesus did, the, the Last Supper. And, it, it, and this is what it says. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you, you proclaim, you remember, you recall the Lord's death until he comes. You remember that? It, it, it's pretty familiar. <clears throat> well, I find it interesting that Paul, when you read his account, it, it seems pretty serene. You know, it, it, it seems just like a really sterile kind of thing. You know, it's like you can you can picture it. You know, the Last Supper. The what was it? Was it Michelangelo that that, that painted the Last Supper? You got the table there, and you got the the disciples all spread out. You know, you can picture that, and it just seems so serene. It's 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 a picture. It's a work of art. But if you read the gospel accounts, it wasn't quite like that. First, Jesus had just mentioned that he was about to be betrayed by one of the twelve. Yeah. And then Luke records this, and it's just a single verse, but it says, they begin to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Now, this was arguably the most important night in Jesus' life. And it descends into a few. Now, we need to understand these disciples had seen miracles performed. They saw what Jesus had done. But they had also performed miracles. And when Jesus started talking about this new kingdom, it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to have my own office. I'm going to have my, my name on the door. I'm going to get to wear a badge that tells everybody who I am and how important I am to this operation. They saw this as a moment to jockey for position. And, and have you noticed, if you ever want to start an argument, <laughs> the best way to start it is to start talking about who thinks they're most important or who's better than whom. You know what I mean? I, I was I was watching the the documentary The Last Dance recently. It's it's about Michael Jordan and you know and, and the Bulls in the in the nineties. And there are people who argue that Jordan was might not have been the best basketball player ever. And those people and the people that really believe that that Jordan were the best, if you want to really get them stirred up, just say, yeah, Michael Jordan was the best bas basketball player, and you'll see it happen. They start fighting over, well, LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan, you know, or whoever. And, and that's, that, that's what happens when you start talking about who's better than whom. You just set yourself up for a fight. 
And while this is going on, I mean, they completely misunderstood what Jesus was trying to get at and what his kingdom was going to be about. Because up until now, you know, it was just kind of a, gla a grassroots thing and they're just kind of going around. But now all of a sudden, they've got a throng of people following them. And so, you know, it, it, we're, we're part of a movement. <laughs> and so we need to, we need to stake out our, our position in what Jesus is going to do here in the future. So when he sees all this happening, Luke says, Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people. Yeah. And yet they're called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like the servant. <clears throat> who is more important? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Well, the one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. And just for the record, the word that Jesus used there for serve and service was the language of a slave. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting thing when you start comparing a servant versus a slave. A servant, they can quit their job. They can decide whether or not they want to continue serving. I, I, I don't think I want to do this today. Well, then I don't think I want you to be employed anymore. Take off. A, a slave, however, has no rights. They can't say that I'm not going to do this. Well, guess what? You're going to do this because you're my property. And this is the picture that Jesus was using. I'm not just a servant. I'm a slave to the will of God. And Jesus wants our obedience. And then the Apostle John adds something, and, and he get, kind of rounds out the picture. He says, so Jesus got up from the table. He took off his robe, and he wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet drying them with a towel that he had around himself. I didn't leave the passage in the slide. I just realized that. But Jesus made himself. I mean, Jesus, at this point in time, he was the most important man. He was the most powerful man that these disciples had ever seen. They might have seen the local magistrate and they might have seen, you know, people who were in charge, religious leaders, but they saw real power yeah. in Jesus. He'd lay his hands on people and they would recover. They would be healed, restored sight, hearing, to raise the dead at this point. Yeah. And Jesus humbled himself before them, to the point where even Peter said, Lord, you can't wash my feet. And the reason why was it, it was it was inappropriate in Peter's world. You're my master, you cannot wash my feet. And, and to, to that Jesus replied, Well, if I don't wash your, your feet, then you, you can't be with me in, in my kingdom. And then Peter said, Well, in that case. Well, it washed me all over. Make me clean. But the, the picture that Jesus was, was trying to drive home to these disciples, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you must be God's slave. And if you know that Jesus did it, you better know that that's what is required of us too. So, how can we practice service this week 
What does service look like? In the book Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster outlines several types of service that we can practice. He talks about hidden service, things that people don't see. And then he talks about small things. You know, th th these are things that most people just won't pay attention to. Like maybe putting the, the, the envelopes in the back of the chairs and, and stuff like that. You know, th those, those are considered small things, you know. Guarding reputations. Mm, yes. If you have ever heard someone's reputation being maligned, to, to stand up and encounter what's being said you know, to guard a person's reputation to practice hospitality mm. you know hospitality is is almost a lost art form in our society today but to practice <coughs> hospitality is is to practice service so those are a few things but i really like the list that james brian smith gives us in his book the Good and Beautiful Life. I keep going back and forth between Richard Foster and James Bryan Smith because their, their stuff kind of works hand in hand together. But he says, go out and give me five intentional acts of kindness and sensible acts of beauty. However, there is one catch. You must do them in secret. No saying, hey, look at what I did. Don't post it on Instagram. Don't post it on Instagram. Don't 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 post it on Facebook or you know shoot somebody a text of you handing out something to someone, you know. Sorry. Yeah. But these things that they include anything that might lighten someone's load. And he gives a list of ideas. And I, I'm just gonna gonna list them up here for you. I, I don't know if you if you if you'd like to take notes, I think. I think we can kind of get the idea after a few of these things, but doing someone else's laundry. <laughs> Fill someone's car with gas. I volunteer my vehicle. <laughs> so kind, so kind. Clean someone's room. Help someone complete a task. Drive someone where they need to go. Listen. To somebody you know I think something that that we overlook is how important it is whenever we listen to someone actually listen you know instead of trying to put a word in you know you're thinking about your response beforehand to listen to them offer to serve at a place that serves others. And I just listed out a few things that Cannery Kitchen here in town, it, it, they, they, they actually have people volunteer to, to come and serve the people that come in for breakfast in the mornings. Uh, New Beginnings, they are always asking for volunteers to help out with, with young mothers who are trying to decide whether or not to, to have their child. And CASA, the, um, the advocates, the, what, what is it, uh, special advocates, child, yeah. Uh, so if kids that are, that are brought into, in, into protective, uh, child protective services, these advocates help these children to get acclimated to wherever foster home that they might go to. And as a matter of fact, I, I got, got an email this past week that CASA is looking for volunteers. So if you're looking for an opportunity to volunteer, to serve in our community, there's plenty of opportunities out there. And then there's a few more things. I couldn't get it all on one slide. Help your kids with their homework. <laughs> Depending on the age of your kid and what they're, they're taking, I, I don't know if, if you'd actually be helping. <laughs> I know like with math, my kids did not want my help at all. Um, borrow someone's car to wash and clean it for them. I volunteer mine for that. <laughs> and the last one, ask God to send you a person in need. Now, I just want to 
caution you, and this was also in the book, be careful. Because if you ask God, he'll come through. And you might be surprised at, at how God wants you to serve this person who he sends to you. So Now, this is no, by no means an exhaustive list. But if, if you want to practice service, if you want to practice serving, then ask God, show me how I can do this in the course of my life. Whether it's on the, the job where you work, whether it's with the people that you interact with, ask God and he'll, he'll show you things. But service is what the kingdom is about. This is the model that Jesus gave us, that we model him before the world. So I, I want to encourage you this week to practice and to, to do five, as James Bryan Smith says. Pick five and practice this week, okay? Let's stand together. Lord Jesus, I thank you. that you call us as your disciples not just to give mental assent to what you taught but that you called us to live our lives unto you and God I ask you to show us ways that you can use us, that we can serve you in the course of our everyday life. I ask you, God, to bring people to mind. That we can serve. That you would bring people into our lives this week that we can serve, that we can practice service with them. It doesn't have to be a big production. It can just be just acknowledging someone. But help us Lord. to see how we can serve in our circle of influence, in our, in our world, in the place where we live. Come Holy Spirit and move in us. Now, before we go, I want to make sure, and I, I, I try to do this every week, and, and I know we, we've been, been a little, what's, what's the word, just a little anxious maybe about, about praying for each other, about touching one another, <laughs> but I want to make sure that we, that we pray for each other in the time we have together because you know we're, we're here for just this this amount of time and I know we, we sang about it today we were talking a little bit in terms of dealing with fear if you're if you're if you have anxiety that is centered around whatever's going on uh, maybe it has to do with the upcoming election. Maybe uh, God wants to free us from fear. I mean, if you're having trouble sleeping at night because you're, you're so overwhelmed with anxiety, God wants to set you free. 
And another thing that I that I also felt this morning getting ready, there's there's many of us. I think, and I I don't want to put a number on it, but I think there's there's several of us that maybe you're dealing with something physical, and you just kind of just say, well, I, I just have to deal with this. This is the way it is, and 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 we. We talk about it all the time that God's kingdom has come. It's come to break in, to, to bring the power of the future, the future kingdom of God. It, it's available to us now. So we can experience God's healing power at any time. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're experiencing pain, if it's it, it, a, a nagging thing that you've been dealing with and, and you just have, have said, yeah, I'm going to have to deal with this the rest of my life, and I'm just not going to ask anymore. I think the Lord wants, wants you to know that he's, he still wants to heal that thing. He still wants to make his presence known in your body and, and, and give you relief. So if you're, if, if you're in that either of those categories, I want to make sure before you leave that we have an opportunity to pray. Now, because of our concerns with the Rona and all that, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a, a like a dismissal prayer, but just because we pray, that doesn't mean okay. Well, it's time to go. We're done. But if if you would like prayer for anxiety, or if you would like prayer for something physical in your body, I want to make sure that we do that before we leave. Okay. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love for us that goes beyond anything that we've ever experienced in our lives. We thank you that you are intimately involved in our lives. And as we go today, I pray that you would let these words, let the words that, that you want us to remember to ring in our ears that you want to use us to serve and demonstrate to our world who you are. And as we go today, Lord, may your presence rest on us. May your hand guide us. May your grace keep us in your peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you.